This is Converge, a podcast from Convera. Come with us as we shape the future of finance. Welcome back to Converge, live at Money 2020, and welcome back to Ryan Rugg of City Treasury and Trade Solutions. Great to have you back, Ryan. You're so generous in your time with us here at Converge. And today we get to talk about, obviously, it's the talk of the town for you. You're making the rounds with regards to um, tokenization um, and how it's impacting the financial sectors um, and what that means for the future. So let's back up high altitude to start. And if you could just tell our audiences, what is tokenization at a high level and how is it currently being used in financial sectors? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks again, Alex, for having me on. So tokenization overall is just a digital representation of an asset. So if it's, you know, from what City is doing, we're tokenizing cash to tokenize deposits. You know, there was a big theme around, you know, real world asset tokenization from bonds, equities, mutual funds to, you know, kind of across the board, as well as, you know, CBDC is a big topic here at Money 2020, mm-hmm. you know, central bank digital currency and the tokenization of you know, central bank money. So it's a really broad kind of what tokenization yeah. encompasses. Yeah, yeah. I read or I happened to read a city report. Um, I think it was released last month. And the title was why tokenization really could be the next big thing. And it mentions that corporate adoption of tokenization hasn't quite reached a tipping point. And I also heard you just say in your stage panel with Elisa that it's taken longer than you expected for these technologies to be more broadly adopted. So what have been the primary barriers thus far for financial institutions and businesses? And why are we now at this point where it could be that next big thing. What's changing or changed? Yeah. So I think back to 2016 when I kind of, when I entered into this space and, you know, we were tokenizing everything from IP, bond, equity, mortgages, repos, but we always had to go back to the TradFi rails for for settlement. So that cash part of it was never on rails. And then, you know, I think about then kind of had, you know, the evolution of crypto and other forms of digital assets via stable coins, CBDCs, you know, I would say adoption there is taking longer because of lack of standards and governance yep. and regulation, you know, in this space. You know, I can speak from like a city perspective, like safety, soundness of our clients is first and foremost on our minds. Mm-hmm. We work in collaboration with our regulators to make sure that we're creating a scalable asset. So like if it's gray, we're not going to operate in that area. So having complete clarity on regulation is also really important in this space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. For a specific use case to focus on, what are the main advantages of tokenization when you're thinking about corporate treasurers? How does it enhance efficiency, security, uh, et cetera, in in the realm of a treasurer? Yeah, so the thesis statement that our clients gave us was they want multi-bank, multi-border liquidity that's always on, 24-7, 365. Mm -hmm. So none of the banking holiday cutoffs or the cutoffs due to, you know, time zones. So if it's, you know, 5 p.m. in New York, it's 5 a.m. in Singapore. Typically, you can't send money. Our clients wanted full transparency, always on, mm-hmm. kind of that. So that's really what the first kind of, you know, use case solution that we're developing with City Token Services for Cash is that, you know, we're live between New York and Singapore now that our clients can send money regardless of the time, regardless of the day. It could be Saturday, Sunday. So, you know, typically large treasurer keeps buffers of cash globally yep. to cover different demands and taxes and payrolls or whatever the case is, supplier payments, where... Now you could have just in time. You could send the money that day, that hour. It takes seconds, if not you know, minutes to be able to get there. And ultimately, it's going to look lower cost from a reconciliation process. So, you know, it's, it settles instantly. You don't have to have that, you know, day or two lag to be able to reconcile the two ledgers. You have instantly, you know, you can actually have more transparency in the sense of that you can see where your money is at all times. You don't have to, you know, manage these multiple different locations. But mm-hmm. it's not just within one bank. They want multiple bank also. And, yeah. you know, We've been working, you know, I spoke earlier with like, you know, Swift and we were part of the working group on their interoperability connector. We've been part of the, you know, regulated liability network with the Fed. You know, there's a lot of different network plays out there to try to, that we're like, you know, learning from so we don't create like a silo token. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned there just what makes blockchain based systems for settlement truly different from traditional rails. It's that 24 seven interoperability. Uh, it's um, if, if you had to go beyond that, what, what unique benefit does blockchain offer and how beyond just that and how truly disruptive 
you, you mentioned, you know, you have to disrupt or be left behind at the close of the, the panel session. How truly disruptive is this technology in this moment where we are now? And is it just that, that sort of regulatory hurdle holding back the race to get in on it? Or is it, um, are there other, you know, things that need to move forward besides regulations in order for it to be the next big thing that everyone is sort of latching onto? Yeah, so I also think well, another big part in part is programmability of this technology that, you know, you could have smart contracts, which smarter yeah. contracts are just, if this happens, then do that. Mm -hmm. So we've taken our tokenized deposits and pre-funded these smart contracts. And the first, you know, company that we worked with was Maersk, you know, passing mm -hmm. through a canal. Yep. If the ship received fuel, then release payments, completely mm -hmm. automating that whole entire process. And you can imagine how you can extrapolate that to several different other, you know, pain points within financial services. Yep you know, overall to really automate it. So it's almost yeah. rethinking the model a lot, mm -hmm. you know, kind of where you high operation, high risk cost, high that, making it extremely efficient and automated. So, mm -hmm. you know, as we think about all the different technologies out there right now, it's hard to like, you know, not hear something about AI, quantum, blockchain. Yeah. You're kind of seeing this almost like technological revolution of all these multiple techs coming together to really change the way that commerce is done. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, blockchain, with the programmability, with the smart contracts, with the always on, kind of matches the speed of the internet, right? Having that yeah. always on, but you don't, payments, money doesn't match the speed of commerce on the internet right now. Yeah. And that's a mismatch. How do we get that more aligned and think about what the future network looks like? So when you envision the payment speed matching the speed of the internet over time, how do you envision that impacting global financial markets when you think about um, you know, real-time atomic settlement? What's it going to look like in the near future when that is actually possible and securities, as an example, can be settled immediately? T0, you know, is the next step after T1. Um, what will that look like for, for global markets? Yeah, we've gone from T2 to T1. It seems like yeah. T0 is probably inevitable in the future. Right. But the reality of it is, is the systems match that, right? The reconciliation yeah. process on our client side mm -hmm. do, you know, when it comes to treasury management, do their ERP systems match the speed? Right. You know, just because they can do it with the bank, you know, instantaneously, you know, move money back and forth. Do their ERP systems, so the reporting yep. system. So I think there's definitely going to be a lag yep. there where the systems themselves kind of get like catch up yep. before we actually see it at scale. And you know, I don't think people are going to always want the 24/7, 365 access, right? right? right. You know, you yep. think about people still use checks. Right. There's yeah. mul there's multiple rails out there. And I think but there will be a need for the kind of that always on infrastructure as we move, you know, kind of the next future state. And who among the clients that you serve has the biggest need for that, do you think? A lot of our digital platforms, e-commerce platforms mm. that are always on mm -hmm. infrastructure and to Makes be able sense. to like, you know, pay. I would say they have a massive need from that. And you could see them investing in this space and multiple different technologies, not just with, the, you know, Citibank, but multiple partners across that yeah. because they're always on, right? So they yeah. want their payments to move at kind of the same speed or the money to move at the same speed as their platforms. Yeah, makes total sense. So obviously another big question and a hurdle is the challenge of interoperability and how to make that happen between different um, blockchains. And one thing that sort of perked a lot of our ears up was when I think the general manager of the BIS brought out a paper talking about something that he envisions called the Finternet, where there's a unified ledger at, that connects central banks and disparate ledgers. And it sounds, you know, it sounds a lot like, you know, a Web3 ecosystem. So how, how critical is, is getting to that Finternet stage for, for banks and the clients you serve? And what solutions are being considered by City that might play into that becoming a reality someday? Yeah, I kind of draw like this is anonymous to like we're in the intranet, intranet days mm -hmm. versus the internet. Like mm -hmm. what are those standards that are going to be established across the board to kind of help that scalability? And you're mm -hmm. seeing multiple different like working groups. And like I joke if, you know, I had a dollar for every network that approached us on to join, mm -hmm. I could retire because that is the future state. And, you know, there's yeah. every there's numerous ones out there. It's unclear which one is going to prevail at this point. And a lot of them are putting out blueprints. But what I can say from my past experience at IBM R3, it can't be owned by one entity. Right. It has to be, you know, a market utility, you know, where it's owned by the industry for the industry. Because right. if, you know, one party owns it and it's for profit, it's just not going to drive the scalability that it needs Absolutely. in the space. Makes, makes total sense. So when you think about the developments in tokenization, what are the ones that financial leaders in corporations and, and businesses around the world 
should be looking at in, let's say, the next one to two years that could accelerate its adoption and, and be impactful for their businesses? You know, coming from, you know, a U.S. domiciled anything, I think that we're heading into a really interesting time with elections. Yeah. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of, you know, candidates kind of positioning themselves around digital assets mm -hmm. and being more forward thinking. You saw, you know, last two weeks ago, SAB 121, you know, it ends up being vetoed by the president. But you're seeing a lot of changes in that space that I think if that clarity comes down, if, you know, this change of administration or, you know, I think it's going to change the landscape drastically. Mm -hmm. And how are you as a corporate or an entity positioned and ready for that? You know, mm -hmm. today, Citi is using tokenized deposits. It's an ERC-20 token to move, you know, cash around. Mm -hmm. In the future, if regulation changes, we need to be ready, you know, and in these, you know, we can't move because, again, we do it in a very compliant and safe way. We can't move, you know, at some of the speeds these, you know, startups move. We, we, we really make sure that all the governance, all the proper legal documents, all the safety, all the soundness is in place before we on bring clients on. So if regulation yep. does change and gives us that clarity, it could really change the landscape. Yeah, you guys are unusually proactive for a traditional financial institution at City, and that's uh, there's there's a lot to be said for that uh, because when those those tides do change with regulation, you know you have the White House now expressing an openness towards working with uh, private and public sector players to figure out how to use, you know, digital currencies and the technology behind it um, for innovative ways. And that's, that's a huge change from just a year ago. So you're obviously setting up for success, your clients able to use these technologies when the time comes. How significant is the role of, of those legal frameworks in the adoption and expansion of tokenization technologies? Are there specific regulatory challenges um, that need to be addressed beyond ones we've already discussed? You know, it, we just need clarity across the board from the regulators. Like, mm -hmm. we're not going to operate in the gray area. You know, whatever our swim lane is, and you know, we'll operate in. But like, we work extremely close with our regulators from the design to the implementation to the reporting to everything to make sure that we're do really focusing on what you know mm -hmm. for a safe and sound way. You know, you've seen this industry unfortunately have some fraud in it, and you know, we want to make sure that we kind of completely take that whole misnomer out. That's not what we're doing like that's not you know we're not touching crypto we're not you know doing anything like that this is tokenized deposits yeah very tr very similar to your traditional you know trad five rails that you have from reporting yeah and if and when regulation changes like we want to be that trusted partner that can help you embark on that journey great um another concern that financial services leaders often have expressed around blockchain is the use of public ledgers where transparency is obviously a key component of of what is offered. The report I mentioned earlier notes that the need, there's a need for third party risk management when using public blockchains in regulated spaces. Can you discuss the types of risks that financial institutions should be aware of and how they might mitigate them effectively while still getting the benefits of public blockchains? Yeah, so when it comes to public blockchains, like still like we're in a private permission version of Ethereum, as I mentioned, like yeah. it's not permissible for us to be on public chains. You know, that being said, from my days and my prior roles, some of the issues that are out there, you know, from sanctions, dealing with like, you know, unknown users from cybersecurity to losing the keys from secure, you know, the scalability, yeah. all that is still in this space. I think that, you know, for currently like city, we're not on a public chain. I don't see that changing unless regulation changes in the near future. But you see that as necessary for the interoperability, though, eventually between all of the different networks. I think Thanks. there could I could also see a space where there's private permission networks. Mm -hmm. You know, like the mm -hmm. like for instance, like the regulated liability network with the Fed, mm -hmm. where you have a consortium of multiple banks, you have yep. you know, a central bank involved, still private permission with the entities that are just on it, but being able to add to that kind of global liquidity. So I think there could mm -hmm. be a space for both in the future. Interesting. Um so last, just to close things out, what should financial institution leaders be doing now to prepare? Obviously, City gives great examples of ways that it can actually start to be experimented and even implemented um, where the regulatory environment allows it. But, you know, just in general, what's a, what are some ways to prepare so that when tokenization is, is more at the doorstep, they'll be ready? So our strategy has been build by partner, right? You know, we're building city tokens internally. 
to work with our clients. And it's really based on our clients' demand. And like, you know, we have what we call an early adopter program for kind of some of our clients that are helping us form our roadmap, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to help educate, but also let you dip your toe in, right? Like mm -hmm. actually using a token to move money, you, you know, being able to utilize it, but also partner out there. There's a ton of great fintechs out there that are extremely smart in this space, understand what they're building, how it could change your, you know, your business. And then, yeah. you know, buy. We also invest in several of these startups in this space also. And, you know, for us to invest, we also dog food it. Like mm -hmm. we're going to use a technology, which I think is important, you know, yep. just reading about it is I don't think enough in this space anymore. We're kind of past that. I think that, you know, yep. you've seen the, you know, kind of the sea changes in this space and yep. like large enterprises, if it's from the ETFs to whatever, you know, city token services starting to get more involved. Yeah. It's, it's a great way to end it. So, um, Thank you, Ryan. Again, you've, you've been a three-time guest here, and we're very grateful to have you uh, share all your insights on the present and the future of tokenization, digital assets, and um, yeah, just can't appreciate it enough. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me.